you see, uh, let's, let's put it this way. If we side with any one country, let us say we side with the United States, and the United States goes to war with China, does our neutral, uh, does our siding with the uh, uh, U.S. help us assure that we will survive as a people? The same thing goes the other way. If we side with China, and the U.S. goes to war with China. Does that mean that the Filipino people will survive this war? You know, when when there are two when there are two giants or elephants that are at war, as you said, you know, the people that uh, this is what you're saying, yes, what what the people who die or what dies is the grass that they trample on. Uh, these giants are fighting. You no, know? there is. Uh, now, why is it, why does neutrality mean something? While there is no war, it is important that our country declares itself a sovereign country and will not a neutral country and will not allow any any uh, power to encroach in our territory. The same thing with the U.S. and China. China has done this, and we have already showed to them that we don't like officially what has been done in their, in their supposed encroaching of our territory. Now, <clears throat> the same thing with the United States should be done. The U.S. freely, without any kind of reaction from the Philippines, uh, uses our territory, uses our bases, uses our ports without having to ask for permission from the, from the country, from our country. They are here. But did, did you ever hear anyone, not, not from Malacanang, not from the Department of Foreign Affairs, declare that they are here uninvited? They are here uninvited. They can force their way here in our shores. But since we cannot get them out, because we are a weak country, but it must be clear that they are here in the Philippines occupying our waters and territory uninvited. That should at least be a declaration. And uh, and for our sake, for the Philippines' sake, we will be establishing our independence and sovereignty in that way. It just so happens that we are not a superpower, so that we can we can use our military power to push them out. But the fact of the matter is, we are still a sovereign, and and we are still a sovereign people, and we have a duty to preserve the integrity of our republic. Can I say some, can I add something to this? Um, can I hear you, Austin? You are muted. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. George, would you like to share something? Uh, please keep our answers in two minutes, no? Um, we have a lot of questions in line. Well, uh, because uh, what, what people are talking about, there is an issue of the South China Sea and an issue of invasion, which is uh, not going to happen unless the U Philippines allows itself to really be a base of the U.S. Why? Because uh, in all these thousand years, China has not invaded the Philippines more than a thousand years. The Philippines, as we indicated, the entire economy of the Philippines is less than 2.6% of one year's growth. Two point, less than half of one year's growth in China. The value is not high enough. If we're talking about the resources China has agreed uh, to share at 60%, Malampaya with the Chevron and uh, Shell and these companies from the West, we are getting less than 10%. Why are we allowing that? Now, China is never going to give up the Spratlys because it needs that base to prevent itself from being surrounded by the US. What the US wants to do is to have free reign. And in fact, US, has territorial rights in the Philippines. We don't have sovereignty. The US, the Philippine president cannot visit the bases without permission from the US. But the US can pass through the middle of the Philippines without 
permission from the Philippines. It passes through the San Bernardino Straits. It passes through the Straits in the Philippines. So if we're talking about sovereignty, the Philippines has already lost it. Now we should prevent ourselves from being a target in the crosshairs of a, of a war because like in the Second World War, the Philippines in trying to defend the US for, for we don't know what kind of gain lost nearly a million lives. The estimates are between 300,000 and 2 million. The usual number as quoted is 1 million. Why no other ASEAN country, even the richer ones, lost more than 80,000 lives? It's because the Filipinos kept fighting for the Americans and when the war was over, the US did not pay the veterans. After two, over 200,000 died already of old age, then they paid some 20,000 or 15,000 veterans. So we are talking about the history will tell us how people will uh, act in the future. I'm not saying we should side with that. The U.S. has given us many benefits. We have grown with the U.S. We have grown with China. There is one country, though, that is asking us to take sides. So if we're talking about aggression, they are not going to come into the Philippines. It has been uh, announced several times by Goles, God rest his soul. It has been announced by <laughs> Lunan and other people. But, but uh, it will not happen unless there is a war and then we allow the U.S. to put weapons here then we might put ourselves in the crosshairs. Yeah. Okay, um, I'd like to also raise a question for Mr. Um, Professor Valdez. Okay. Yes, um, I will just read the question. So China is aware that US military wanted control over the South China Sea and the Malacca Strait to choke China of food and fuel supply in case of war. Um, they are also aware that the mainland is vulnerable from attack from the sea, the way the British did, sailing from the Yangtze River to compel them to trade in opium. I think this is a br brief history that is about to repeat itself. So is there a way China can be compelled to abandon militarizing the South China Sea claim in the face of an existential threats from the U.S.? So, so thank you for the question. Yeah. First of all, as far as I remember, the first one that militarized the Southeast South China Sea is the United States. In 2011, they already announced that 60% of their naval forces, which is the largest naval force in the world, was going to go to South uh, in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, as you know, is largely the Philippines, right? Now, uh, under the guise of uh, freedom of navigation, they said that they are here plying the waters of South China Sea and all the way into the Malacca Straits to preserve freedom of navigation, right? Because they were here, it became... Uh, uh, I suppose it became necessary on the part of the Chinese uh, to start preparing a possible defense on their side. The defense has been, has been in various different ways. So they became more and more assertive as, an, as more and more U.S. military warships were flying the, the seas. Now, prior to this, there has already been, uh, un, there were analysts already talking about the um, encirclement of two countries used uh, by the United States, encirclement of China and the encirclement of Russia. As you know, one of those uh, very significant uh, moves that they had made, uh, U.S. had made, was the uh, creation of the regime change in Ukraine. Ukraine is right across the border of Russia. And once they took over Ukraine, they did not make this a secret. Even their own CIA had admitted publicly that they spent $6 billion doing this. And they were kicked out the president, changed the president, then got a, got a government that was uh, uh, a puppet government for the United States. Now, 
what do they do? They put in their uh, nuclear nuclear war arsenal and right outside the walls of uh, Russia. The same thing uh, is happening here in China. They're moving into the South China Sea with their forces with a claim that there should be freedom of navigation, which means it is not it is not China's intention to stop the trade uh, in Malacca Straits. It was the U.S. that went into the Malacca Straits to, the, to, to take over the Malacca Straits. Remember, if the U.S. blocks the Malacca Strait, China will suffer because China makes use of the Malacca Strait for their trade. So it is a matter of accusation versus accusation. But let me let me have been, uh, go back. After having said that, our KDP had made a proposal. Like I said, I used the principles of the Treaty of Westphalia. What was this proposal about? It was about the initiation of the Philippines to talk to the 10 member Asian countries as one and as one, as a unified one, ASEAN countries go to China and convince China that ASEAN countries and China will guarantee freedom of navigation of the Malacca Straits and the China Sea, both for the military and, and the, the, the uh, ASEAN countries. Now, the guarantee, because anyway they're doing that, guarantee means we will not intervene. Remember, the Malacca Straits is primarily Southeast Asian countries that are there. So it is to their interest that there is no war in those areas. And if that is the condition that the U.S. press, they are want a guarantee of the uh, freedom of navigation, then grant them that. But as soon as they accept that, in China might want, and I, I suggest that China open up the Krakenal in, in Thailand. They are so good technologically uh, to be able to open that up, the Isthmus in Thailand, to open up the Krakenal, which provides another way from the Indian Ocean into the China Sea. So now there will be two two uh, ways to be able to get into the China Sea, which makes the control of one already uh, not as critical as, uh, as the way it is now. No? Because there are now two routes. It is useless to try to control both. No? So once that happens, and, and the U.S. is convinced that there is no uh, 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 intervention into the freedom of navigation. You must remember there is a present uh, trade um, trade negotiations between the U.S. and China. As a matter of uh, uh, of uh, negotiation, maybe <clears throat> maybe China can offer to help the U.S. rehabilitate its infrastructure, particularly their uh, railway systems. The railway system is already backward. Their fastest is 90 kilometers per hour. Where in the fast rail systems of, the, of, uh, of China, the slowest is 400 kilometers per hour. They have maglev uh, technology already. Why is it? <clears throat> it can be done as a matter of a trade arrangement that China is asked by the United States to do this. But China also offers it. So once you've got these two countries working together in this way, do you think there will be an easing of the tension in South China Sea? I believe so. I believe so. And those were the, the steps that need to be taken. And subsequently, agreements between countries, uh, between China and, and 
in the Philippines and Vietnam and Malaysia and all of the stakeholders in, can be made for joint exploration of the resources of China Sea. Again, I go back <clears throat> to the principle of the Treaty of Westphalia, wherein they said that these rivers, these bodies of waters, is better used as commercial corridors for commerce rather than territorial boundaries. And that became the start of the development of Europe as we know it. So it can also be the same here. Now, is it too far-fetched that something like this can happen? Uh, Professor, maybe, watch 30 seconds. Maybe so. It might be far-fetched from the standpoint of what is happening right now when they're already in confrontation. But nevertheless, the proposal has to be put down there you know, so that uh, maybe not today, in the, but in the future, some, some people in life can do the same thing. Thank you, Professor Boch. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. These are getting heated topics. <laughs> Mimi, you have a next question? All right. uh, yeah, well, there's just a short question here, but I think it's very important for everyone. Um, well, first, thank you, Sir uh, Professor Butch, for the presentation. It's very, yeah, it's very research and provoking, especially that we have our students asking um, educators like us. So um, we have a question for uh, Sir George C. So how do you advise Filipinos to manage the flood via news? So what are our reliable sources do you recommend? Well, uh, th there are various sites that you can check, uh, both uh, local and international. For one, IBC will post regularly, if you look at our site, uh, answers to news that are either without perspective sometimes they're true to you know they're true in some facts but not uh in in terms of timing or in details or in perspective uh so we will post that there are also there's also the site truth matters internationally you can also look at uh, various sites uh from rt uh they some people will say it's russian or cgpn but then the point is they always present evidence as whereas the u.s sites are cnn fox based will talk as if the uh, material coming from their intelligence organizations are the final word and should not be doubted. When we have seen time and again that the CIA and the intelligence agencies have, uh, including secretaries of state, don't mind lying to their teeth, as they did in the Iraq war, saying that there were weapons of mass destruction or chemical weapons in uh, Syria. Uh, so, uh, also, it would be helpful if uh, having hold of this information to help disseminate it not to create conflict, not to be against the U.S., because there's so much we can gain from that friendship with the U.S., and there's so much that they can benefit from us as well. We should not only think that uh, we will benefit from them. We should create value that we believe people will benefit from us. So, you know, uh, although we are taking up this topic, to me, it's actually uh, an indication of how political we are. If you look at the newspapers in, uh, in India, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, 70% of the front page are business. In our case, it's 90% politics. No? So that's why I would rather be talking about topics like uh, Carrie is talking about how we're going to move ahead, how we're going to help our people, but our interest is politics. We have to deal with this. So we have to spend time on this as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, Going. Uh, speaking of Carrie, Carrie, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, we have another uh, question from uh, a principal who is uh, part of an association of high schools from Bicol. Uh, his question is, uh, can you give us a, a short uh, a landscape? Let's say a student starts off with your ICT Academy. Uh, what are the steps on or how far, you know, from, let's say in, in karate, you go from white belt to black belt and then black belt you can teach or, 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 or work as, you know, uh, martial artists, uh, is that something that uh, is available in Huawei? Do you start from basic and, and how far can they advance? And uh, do you provide scholarships where uh, we heard the Huawei campus in, in China is uh, inviting uh, international all over the world, no? engineers and getting world-class training. Uh, is that available? And uh, second question in relation is, 
uh, are the skills learned through the Huawei Academy applicable to other telecom brands? Okay, uh, first, so we have uh, three categories or three steps in our learning. So the very basic one is Huawei ICT Associate. The second is Huawei ICT uh, Professional. And the last one is uh, Huawei ICT Expert. So these are the two levels. For high school students, we also have a, a digital platform. We call it the, the Digital Academy, where they can uh, teachers can use that as... Uh, um, you know, pre-reading or if they wa want to watch a video, for example, um, STEM, ICT track, they want to learn about uh, what is TCP IP. So this is a technical term, So, but it, it's a basic, uh, how do you configure uh, TCP IP? So we have some resource there where, which is done in animation. So we, especially, for example, if you go to our learning on site, we have their IoT, Internet of Things. One of the first uh, key videos that you will see is an animation video because we want to, you know, learn it from the basic, the easiest way. Um, not because the, uh, the, the requirement really of the academy is uh, technical background, at least uh, if not ICT, uh, engineering that's the main requirement but we do have courses that do not require too much of uh, uh, the ICT background but uh, more on logic so we we encourage them to try and see because it's for free and uh, what's the second question Austin like uh, are the skills that uh, we learn in Huawei programs applicable can we use it in other brands uh, okay um, we tell the students that uh, this is like uh, everything is uh, generic. So it's like riding a bi bicycle or driving a car. So it doesn't have to do anything to do with the brand of the car you're driving or the bicycle. Because what we offer is uh, three steps of learning. So there's theoretical and there's practice. So, and then there's the exam. So what happens is during the practice, you can, we have a software, like for example, for IP routing and switching, we already have a, software laboratory where you can actually uh, see and actually configure a router without having the router in your own school or in it's, it's in your laptop it, it's it's downloadable um, it, it's actually very you can try to connect all the you know and put your program inside and it will tell you if your program will run or not so it, it's the training it's the practice that makes everything perfect so uh, before you go out of the university, you are sure that you already know the steps. But of course, uh, there, some, there are some going to be some minor tweaking when it comes to if you will do other brands. But the basic or the foundation will always be there. For IP routing and switching, you will learn about IP tables. You will learn about switching. You will uh, learn all these very basic concepts. So it, it's the practice that we want to, to impart on the students so that when they go to, to, you know, like offices or apply for a job, they already know what this is. They have the foundation. Okay. Uh, Mimi, you had a follow-up? Yeah, um, maybe the last question for Huawei. So what are the challenges? So wait, let me read it. Okay, so what are the challenges that Huawei has faced um, in partnership with their universities and trainings with the students? If there are some in particular, is, is it okay if you can share with us, Ms. Carey? Uh, okay, uh, real life, yeah. uh, just the other day, we were doing the online exam and suddenly one of the students said, oh, it's brown out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, also we have experienced some uh, lagging in the internet so it, it's still the infrastructure because we are online uh, most of us experience this right now and uh, uh, and initially in the beginning there were trust points uh, to be honest like uh, why Huawei you're Chinese so there were those questions but I said that uh, we should move forward because uh, in education it, it's like uh, it's for free. It, it's where we are allowed to make mistakes, right? We are open to ask questions. Uh, education is uh, is like this, uh, where we can explore all our potentials. 
So I think that that's one of the keys so that, uh, you know, like our initial, like we were supposed to, we were trying to launch this as early as 2017, but uh, um, uh, very difficult. It was only in 2018 when uh, we had success. It, and it's even in Mindanao. So University of Southeastern Philippines and MSU IIT, just right after Marawi siege, we were in MSU IIT because we we noticed that uh, the students there were placing in the uh, we call it uh, the ICT's uh, Philippine Startup Challenge, and you know like we know how come these students you know coming from Mindanao can place in a nationwide competition? So there must be something there. And said, so, okay, we'll go there right after uh, they allowed people to fly in to Marawi. We're there, so we talked to MSU IIT, and they are now delivering our our courses and hopefully maybe in then in when they have the first graduates um we, we can hopefully partner with them and do a you know career or job fair okay thank you um uh, uh just to correct no uh, mimi said this is the last question for carrie oh, okay. on, this, on this cycle no not not for this session no so please yeah. please stay tuned now we have a lot more uh, interesting questions coming i'd also like to point out that there are some uh comments and some explanations shared by our other um, reactors now we have uh, professors here on the on the on the group we have uh, researchers international researchers now we are uh, represented today from manila to ilocos to davao and i think we have a group from uh, zamboanga also no and of course everybody in between we also have uh, researchers from, from hong kong singapore and also from the us no so we have friends uh, from all over the world uh, and uh, please do connect with us, idsicenter at gmail.com, and uh, we will uh, share also your comments with the speakers now. Uh, Mr. George and Mr. Bush, maybe you can share. Uh, we know you also have uh, philanthropy and uh, organizations that help our scholars um, through your different organizations. Can you share us, you know, um, your experience with how our scholars are doing during the COVID and, you know, uh, how, how do you look forward to, to the new normal? in terms of our scholarship and education systems? Well, if, you, if you're asking me about the KDP, uh, we have not uh, gone into uh, providing scholarships for uh, students uh, during the, this period. No? Uh, but rather, of course, we do a lot of teaching through the online uh, television station that we have called the Katipunan channel here in Facebook and in and in uh, in the YouTube um, and uh, as far as uh, the sabi mo kasama namin mga dean professor okay hello everyone please mute your audio we can hear you uh, go ahead sir yeah so uh, as far as that concerns not that but it's uh, what we do however we provide an insight of what we can look forward to, you know? yeah, and how uh, the different areas of uh, governance are going to be affected in education, for example, in agriculture, in economics primarily, of course. You know? um, how, what are the steps that you're going to be seeing in the future? Because, because uh, there is no, I do not think really, you know, that these things are going to be improving uh, in the snap of our fingers. No? Um, many, many economists, and including ours, no, has been uh, brought down in, in the most dramatic form, probably in history. No? And it will take a lot more to just go back to so-called normal, because our normal was already bad to start with. No? Uh, you have to create a different economic program, a completely different economic program, probably a reversal of what we had before, so that we can transform our economy from what we were previously, which was a service economy, we can transform it into a productive economy. Uh, and meaning investments, heavy investments, into infrastructure, not just roads and bridges, you know, but energy, you know, water, and all uh, telecommunication. All of these areas that need uh, that are needed you know, 
for uh, for uh, the uh, business environment you know, to be able to work on. Without these basic industries, uh, infrastructure in energy, water, and telecommunications, you know, uh, businesses are not going to be able to put up. Right okay. now, we're paying the highest electricity rates in the world. No. Uh, and, and we're not going to be able to attract anybody to come here. So we have to generate it from ourselves. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. George, would you like to say a few insights? There, there are a few things that, uh, well, that's partly that we need STEM graduates because the Philippine STEM graduates is, uh, those who select STEM courses are less than 20% of the students. Uh, not only that, they, when they graduate, uh, you don't really know that, uh, you can't really feel that they were STEM graduates, <laughs> most of them, because uh, as uh, Carrie has pointed out, and all the technical companies, engineering companies will say, they need at least one or two years of uh, underground training because there is no uh, applications that is being, they're taught in a very theoretical way without ground experience, unlike the European, uh, European model of uh, vocational training along with a degree. So that's one thing we have to do on the ground experience. There has to be both on the business side, engineering side, science, profession, so on. And there's a big preference in the Philippines for taking up a law or medicine. And uh, people really think that law entertainment, they, they, they dream of becoming entertainers. They dream of becoming lawyers and then politicians. Maybe that's a business model they're looking at. Uh, it hurts the country. Uh, we need to have more engineers because without an ecosystem, having isolated engineers or people who can do technical programming or so on, uh, you don't have an ecosystem. It becomes very unstable. So I've started the tech companies before that succeeded, but you know, after a while, you know, the people will move very quickly. And even though they say they want to be partners, the entrepreneurial instinct is very weak. That means that you give them shares, but they're not willing to gamble on the shares. Somebody offers them 20% more, they're going to move. I tell you, they're going to move. So they say they want to ride with you as an owner, but they're going to move. So when they move, you have to start from scratch again with the next guy because that guy is not uh, competent. And so, uh, but from the business side also, you have to say, uh, we have the brightest, the Filipinos are second to none. They have very, very bright students, but the, the drive, that's a different question. This satisfaction level is easily reached. So even if they go to the Ivy League schools, many of them retire at 50, 60 years old. Whereas the Chinese at 50 or 60, they just made their basic fortune. And that's when they, the next 20 years is when they build a really big fortune because that's when they have the contacts, they have the experience, they have the capital, and they can really drive up, uh, multiply their fortune by five or 10 times but then there, the Filipino stops. So I'm not saying that's wrong morally. I'm saying from an economic system, aside from that, uh, when you have a scholar, the tradition, other Asian tradition, if you benefited from it and you become successful, you support the next one. But uh, in general, the Filipinos say, I have to take care of my own family. So th there's a virtuous cycle that we need to enculturate. And that will be very helpful for the country, both from an ecosystem and a family basis. Uh, thank you very much uh, for those insights. Uh, I, I just want to mention that it's four o'clock, as, as we promised, it's a two to four o'clock webinar. But I can see we still have 140 plus participants in Zoom and we have several hundred more on our Facebook Live. No? So do we would like to say thank you for joining us this afternoon. But we will continue. No? Uh, we're not ending yet. No? There are still about a dozen or so questions now. So for those who would like to stay, uh, please do uh, stay. No, there are some students who asked me whether this uh, Zoom will get disconnected. I think it's because you used, uh, if, if you use a free version, it's a 40 minute time limit now, but this is a uh, subscribe uh, webinar uh, so we can extend as, as long as we're, we would like now. So uh, yeah, uh, the yeah, next- did, did you tell them uh, how long they have to stay to get some credits? <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, uh, the, the incentive will be uh, the next set of questions will be uh, practical in nature that uh, our friends and, and family members can can uh, can take home also for for their own uh, applications. No, uh, Mimi, I think you have a next question. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm business. 
related to business. Oh, uh, wait. It's more of, yeah, it's still a technology concern. Um, well, I have to address this to Ms. Carrie. Um, so when we say we're embracing the modern technology as Huawei is doing, so there are claims on emerging electromagnetic waves causing health issues and problems. So how does Huawei address in minimizing these side effects? Uh, Kari, no, nakamute ka. Wait, wait. Uh, Kari, nakamute. Hold on. Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, based on that? studies, Can you even... Can that, Kari? You were mute. Okay. Now. Yeah. So, uh, research not coming from China but coming from the United States have already measured. We actually came out with uh, an animated video that the, the emission of a cell phone or a microwave is even more than what the tower is emitting because the tower is designed to be 30 feet above your head so that means that uh there is very little chance of you getting like sick or because you use your phones all the time you put it to your ear so that even emits a lot more uh you know electromagnetic pulses or even the microwave that we're using right now is emitting more so it, it's actually unfounded if if uh, you know if uh, cell phones or if or if uh, EMP is really uh, bad, then how come we're using it? How come we're still alive? How come we're still here, right? So science have already debunked that uh, theory, and uh, it's it's not yet proven. That yeah. Okay. Yeah. I. I think that's a. That's a. Uh, that. That is also a uh, more of a philosophical question, no? Because if we really hope for that direction, then we probably have to relocate to some island uh, and, and live there. Uh, but it, it might actually be more rewarding, no? Uh, but uh, today's world, actually, I cannot live uh, without my my cell phone, and I have two. So <laughs> it depends on how you who you move there with. <laughs> Okay, uh, next question. This is uh, from a uh, someone who started the home cooking business during COVID. Uh, for anyone or Mr. Um, George, uh, this was actually addressed to you. For a student who started the home cooking business during COVID, how would you advise the startups to succeed in business with only little capital, especially under the new normal now? But, or, but it, uh, for the other speakers who have insights, uh, please do share your points now. Well, first of all, your, your cooking has to be good and the price doesn't have to be the cheapest depending on the market. If you're going for the premium market, uh, your price can be up to 20, 25% higher and people will accept it as long as they like the food. Um, that means, but if you're going for the basic, basic market where people uh, have to count the cost uh, significantly, then you have to go be price competitive and then if you keep improving your product uh you will be able to advance but let me say this a lot of people pick the category that they want to be in maybe we should look we, we should look at the category we have experience in and advantage in but we should also look at where the categories have a big business so that in that one that can scale and one that can grow so for instance, uh, let me say some of our friends in our club uh, started dealing in vegetables and within uh, two months, they're able to sell more than they can supply, right? But because their logistics is good and we experienced the same thing also to help some farmers in some province, uh, our family also started selling. We had, the, I had my children start selling vegetables and we also started selling ice cream. So that means you want to try to hit upward to a business if you can where the margins don't matter so much then you can compete on marketing or uh, some special category than price unless you are a very efficient producer if you compete on price you're going to fall sooner or later because the next one who uh, sells for 50 centavos less palo can i no so but i, I will tell you the experience and uh, both the ice cream and vegetables these companies and people through friends uh, approach us to help them market. And this is all through the internet. 
and they don't study the logistics very well. They don't study logistic planning. No, when we ask the ice cream, I will not say which, the ice cream people, can you put label for uh, who is accepting that order? They told us we have to have at least this much order for delivery. We met their orders and exceeded it. And then suddenly it comes with a 20, 30% less delivery. They did not even tell us. So what will our customers think of us, right? Because then we cannot deliver to them after they paid. Of course, we pay them back. Then my managers and help have to be paid more for that time. So the overhead goes up. And then we tell them that, uh, please, uh, uh, why don't you have the size and you can increase the price and your margins will remain the same even higher because Filipinos, they don't want to buy, let's say for instance, a full gallon of everything. They, will, they want to buy half a gallon, not every family now wants a full gallon or can fit their refrigerator. They didn't think of that. They just said, no, I want a full gallon and they do it. So we have problems with this. And I'm saying that this is very common. I've been in business 40 years. A lot of Filipino companies that the way you think, they don't want to adjust. So the same with the vegetables. They don't tell us when there will be over delivery, under delivery. They don't tell us they replace this with that. And they, you know, maybe 10, 20% of the goods are the wrong allocation. And they don't deal with that. But I say to my children that we want to help the Filipinos. So just keep telling them what they have to do. But if they keep making that mistake, every problem you have, Every pain point you have is an opportunity. So if my children are aggressive and they might not be enough, if these suppliers cannot make it and you know there's a demand, then start producing your own or looking for another supplier and building your own brand, right? So every negative is a potential positive. But I would say don't uh, start with the market you're comfortable with. It's okay to lose a little money or not make money because you're getting experience. Correct the mistakes and then start moving upward. Uh, your voice, you're muted. Yeah, thank you for those insights and those pr pr uh, practical applications also. No? We'll get back to some of more of those questions, but this was asked several times. Uh, in, in, in addition to uh, the different groups that we have across the country, across the world, we also have from across organizations. We have from government, uh, from uh, uh, business, from media. Now we have prioritized some of the questions from the media. So if you have uh, media questions, please uh, identify yourself and we will priority your questions. No? Um, this question came from our friends from the National Defense uh, College of the Philippines. Uh, we have uh, professors and graduate students. Uh, their question is, uh, uh, how should we reconcile the military position, a Filipino perspective that China will definitely not let go of the South China Sea due to the presence of other military installations in the South China Sea? Does that justify the Chinese blocking our Filipino from fishing in the area? Are there more concerns on the natural resources, that oil, gas, plus special minerals? There are experts who predict one flashpoint of the U.S.-China hybrid war, or what they call the, the uh, what was the proxy, proxy war, is the South China Sea. How serious is the nuclear threat? This is for Mr. Butch and Mr. George. Well, I think... Uh... The nuclear threat is very serious. Now, uh, if we are going to ask uh, ourselves, why is the military, what position should the military take whenever there are incursions into our territory? Uh, or uh, the, way, uh, the way, for example, China is doing. No? It is, the, it is uh, basic and fundamental in, uh, in anyone from the military who uh, swears to defend the Constitution, no. to defend the Constitution. There are only two, there are only two uh, officers uh, that, are sw uh, that swear to defend the Constitution. One is the president, and then the other is the military. All the rest, including the Senate and all other, they are sworn to follow the Constitution. Okay. Now, to ask, uh, if we're going to ask uh, anyone from the military, at, uh, what are you going to say about these incursions? Of course, he's going to say, if there are incursions, no, we, have to, we have to act. We have to do whatever is necessary, uh, confront them or whatever is uh, available to us. No? Um, uh, over and above, of course, the, 
the protests, the uh, diplomatic protests that can be made. Um, <clears throat> but um, there are people intent on creating war. Uh, this is, we have to juxtapose this into the overall economic situation of the world. And uh, this, is, this is connected. Every time there is a threat of a uh, world economic collapse, or at that point, the, we have had World War I, World War II, and possibly World War III. You know? All of this is going to be instigated by an economic collapse. And right now, uh, if we, we don't forget that prior to this COVID and prior to all of these things, there has already been a, um, a threat of the collapse of the world financial system, you know? where all countries, the United States and the whole of Europe, have been uh, printing up money, you know? and they called it bailout system. A bailout system means they print up the money uh, and uh, to bail out those that are in the that are uh, uh, into the speculative investments, but the value of that money really goes down. You know? uh, as you print up and it does not go into production, the uh, there is a devaluation of that currency. The problem is all the rest of the world you know, is connected to the U.S. dollar, and as the U.S. dollar prints up. You know, the value of that currency goes down and the purchasing power of all our currencies also goes down. This is a crisis that uh, has happened over and has continued to get worse and worse over the past uh, decade and a half. So now there is this COVID of course that accelerates the possibility of uh, nuclear conflict. Okay. Thank you for those insights, uh, Mr. George. Uh, yes, the the uh, first I, I, that's correct because there's an incentive for the U.S. to have war to shore up its currency because they don't intend to pay with goods and services provided. Uh, but there's ways out of it because it's uh, it's it's not a limited field. Everybody can benefit, and they have benefited before. The problem now is not that. Uh, China or the U.S. benefits. The U.S. is very wary and they don't want to be one of the winners. They want to be the only winner on top. They're willing to have other winners, but they did this to Japan before when Japan was progressing. They forced Japan to give all their technology and to devalue their currency. Now, in the terms of the nuclear threat, there is a real nuclear threat because the U.S. has already declared that it is willing to do a preemptive strike and to use an, uh, limited nuclear weapons, they say. What the limits are only they can say, and we have seen that they have launched missiles in Syria, even prior to investigations of chemical warfare, where the UN has already declared the weapons did not come from the Syrian government side, but from certain rebels. And those rebels seem to be connected with uh, uh, shady people that uh, we will not discuss at this point in time. And uh, as to the oil and gas, uh, oil and gas, yes, it is true that there are expected to be oil and gas, but given the very low prices currently, even the ones that are, uh, the countries that are drawing it from the ground can hardly make money. The prices are so low. So what makes you think drawing it from 10,000 feet under the sea is going to make money? We don't have the technology, we don't have the money. And, but China is saying that they're willing to give 60% of the income. Of course, we don't expect totally 60%. They'll probably cut the expenses somewhat, but that is far higher in any case than what we're getting 10% only from the Malampaya fields dealing with the West. So why do we insist on dealing with the West when they don't have rights there and China is a disputant and we can have peace by dealing with China? So there are questions of those things. No? Uh, so one way around it is to share the benefits until such time as maybe the, the, the heat goes down and something can be solved. The US, it's a dangerous situation because uh, China is a po popular issue with the voters. So uh, you, uh, Trump is saying that uh, you can't vote for Biden, Biden's gonna sell us to China. So Biden has to show that he's not going to sell us to China. So it becomes an issue. And so it's going to remain a contentious issue even if Biden wins or Trump wins but maybe the heat will be at a different level. Uh, China does not need to conquer the Philippines. 
again, we said the total value of Philippine economy is so small. And given that we, have, we are blessed with natural resources, but what we can see in the last 20 years, the reason in fact that the US is so heated about China, uh, because China might catch up, because China is able to buy the minerals, the resources, the uh, fish, the uh, meat and everything at the highest prices, higher than the US is paying for and still produce end goods at the lowest cost, lowest price. So they don't need to steal, they don't need to invade just by producing. And you see by their investments in logistics and infrastructure that they're going to become more and more efficient. And another player is coming into the market. Vietnam is becoming very efficient also. So today's game, there is no need for war. The war is more costly than business. So, uh, so there is really no need. There is one party and the only motivation is to stay on top and to prevent others rise. Because in open competition, as we uh, showed earlier in the statistics, uh, in terms of technology, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of manufacturing capacity, uh, it's only a matter of time. If the U.S. doesn't stop China, China will overtake the U.S., which is, we understand why they're doing it. We don't feel that it's morally justified. Okay. Uh, in connection, no, I, I'll just add uh, one more uh, question from, from their group now because they they have to leave soon. Uh, some of them have, have uh, classes to attend no? uh, through, through online. Um, so, so the next question for, for our uh, geopolitical analyst is uh, what is your assessment uh, of Duterte's independent foreign policy and what is, the, what is your projection post-2022 and in relation, uh, how, would Saba's, uh, how would Saba affect the ASEAN geopolitics? Am I supposed to answer? Okay, I did. Uh, I I, I would like to say that uh, what President Marcos didn't have no, uh, is uh, what uh, President Duterte now has. President Marcos, during his time, when he had to fend off the United States impositions on us, no, he didn't have Russia and China behind him. On the other hand, no, President Duterte, has Russia and China behind him. So when the U.S. started imposing itself, did Obama, Obama, Barack Obama, the president of the U.S. then, uh, in just one sentence, President Duterte declared what his foreign policy was. He says, we are no longer your colony. You must remember that during, prior to President Duterte, our country was no longer invited to certain important um, international meetings. Why? Because they felt that they were just going to mouth uh, the same thing that the U.S. says, or we follow exactly what the U.S. tells us to say. But now, because of the President Duterte, he has been able to say we are independent. And when, uh, when Obama says we're not going to give you the US 700 million of U.S. aid, it's okay, he says. We have other friends. And the, the two friends, of course, were China and Russia, who readily assisted uh, the needs of the, of the Philippines. So that is, uh, that is the situation. Now, on the Saba issue, it's contentious because they have already taken the position uh, that, uh, that due to the referendum that they had uh, conducted, I don't know exactly when, the people of Sabah prefer to be with uh, Malaysia. That is the referendum supposedly, and it's according to international observers and so on and so forth, that is what they claim. It doesn't mean that the Philippines should stop with their claim, no? because we have a historical claim on the Sapa issue. Now, it is for, I suppose, for uh, the international, uh, not Soros' uh, court, but the United Nations to help us uh, decide on uh, as to exactly what, what is going to happen here. No? It is said that uh, during the time of uh, President Marcos, 
when uh, he wanted to take over and invade Sabah because we have an historical claim to it, and Sabah uh, and Malaysia was not going to give it to us. As he was preparing for this quietly, uh, a, a Senator Benigno Aquino disclosed this uh, in public in a, in a privileged speech. He said that there was a secret effort by Marcos training people, which is in uh, Jabida, training people to invade, uh, in, to invade uh, Sabah or Borneo. And uh, there were at that time already about 2,000 soldiers in, uh, in Sabah. When, uh, <clears throat> when Benigno Aquino disclosed this, uh, the Malaysian authorities closed down Sabah and started hunting down the Filipino soldiers that have already infiltrated into Sabah and killed all of them. That is a sad uh, point in our history. Uh, and Benigno Aquino did this only for his political considerations and not for, not for uh, uh, our historical claim. That's why subsequent to that, Corazon Aquino and Noinoy Aquino uh, already said that they are no longer uh, going to push that claim of the Philippines uh, for Sabah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, Mr. George. Yes. Um, that, that is very correct. That uh, supposed, uh, that's one of the fake news, big fake news in the Philippines now. Supposedly, Marcos had uh, uh, the numbers vary between 24 to 68 uh, Muslim brothers killed, which turned out to be a total lie. We have done our research, and uh, just as Tiglao and others have found, there is no evidence at all of these people having been killed. There's no families coming forward, except recently when they offered uh, compensation. Then, of course, everyone comes forward. But before that, for decades, nobody came forward to present themselves as uh, Greek parties. No? Uh, in this case, we have to remember that, uh, yes, there was an attempt by Marcos to take over Saba. Actually, that was together with uh, another government that I will not uh, say. Uh, and uh, the exposure by uh, th this fake news by uh, Ninoy Aquino, which until today is in Wikipedia and other international uh, uh, sources of information that we should correct, uh, has caused uh, Malaysia to, at that time it was credible, so the Philippines was more powerful militarily than Malaysia at that time. I'm not saying it's correct, that's just really how it happened. And uh, because of that, the Filipinos were killed, the same as in 2013, when uh, another Filipino group under the Chiram family tried to uh, invade and take over what they considered their land again. Uh, the Filipinos again were killed and were not protected by Ninoy at all. In fact, they were castigated. Uh, and Malaysia, through the years, has been known to be supporting the rebellion in Mindanao. So what uh, Ninoy did, actually started the basis for the MNLF and MILF and created the rebellion. And uh, now we are apparently are being thankful to Malaysia for brokering a peace for a rebellion that they created. But uh, Roque is taking the right position and also Duterte that even while we're claiming the Saba, we are going to continue peaceful relations and interchange with Malaysia. Yeah. No, so if we're going to talk again about these claims, Saba is a far bigger value than the South China Sea. Why is it that these people keep talking? I'm not saying we should not, but if you are going to claim the smaller price, why would you not claim the bigger? You're going to fight China instead of Malaysia, and uh, you're going to fight the bigger power militarily and economically. Why are they doing this? Are they doing this for the Philippines or for the US? Okay, uh, sir, uh, Mr. George, quick quest, a uh, quick assessment of Duterte's uh, independent foreign policy and post 2022. Uh, it's very hard to say because it depends on who wins in the U.S. and who wins here. China is fairly consistent. Uh, we also want to point out this independent foreign policy 
has led us to have increased investment from all countries, including Japan and the USA, instead of less. So the respect we gain by standing on our own ground is an important thing that we have to learn. We don't have to be anyone's uh, following anyone uh, needlessly and without, uh, without any conditionality. And also, we have to note also a very important thing. Uh, without the help of Russia and China, we might not have solved the Marawi rebellion and it might have spread to Manila because at that time, the U.S. actually blocked all arms and supply sales to the Philippines. They blocked not only U.S. shipments, but EU shipments. And China and Russia gave us the arms that allowed us to win the fight. Although, in fairness, the Americans later on, uh, when the uh, Russians and Chinese have already given us the arms to fight, uh, the U.S. released the arms also as well. Okay, thank you for those insights. No, I just want. Ah, yes, go ahead, Professor Boch. Go ahead. Just one, one, one sentence. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, recently, uh, Secretary Pompeo has point blank asked uh, as President Duterte for the use of the Subic base. No? Uh, again, as a military base for them, for the United States of America. And uh, quite readily, the president rejected this uh, request. Subsequent to that, about two to three weeks after, again, the U.S. asked the Philippines to participate in military exercises in South China Sea, because it did in the previous, in the previous uh, years. And, uh, Again, the president disallowed our military to participate in the military exercises by the Americans. Just that, that by itself indicates to you what, uh, what the foreign policy of the president is. Okay, thank you for, for those insights. Uh, I just want to uh, give a disclaimer. No? Uh, all of the positions and uh, statements by the speakers are their per of, of their personal capacity, no? So uh, no one is representing the other or the organization that they might be, organizations that they might be affiliated with, no? So this is really a uh, personal sharing and, and uh, a productive sharing for, for our friends and, and family, no? Uh, at the same time, uh, just to give a bit of a overview again for those who just joined in, no? Uh, our goal in this webinar is not to go to the in-depth of, of the topics, no, but to give more of a salo-salo, like a, uh, a dim sum no? of, of, uh, of uh, topics, ideas that uh, we can go in further. No? And as you can see, our experts, our speakers have far more uh, depth and, and knowledge that they can share. No? So we do have a webinars planned for history, uh, unwritten, untold history of the Philippines. Uh, the digital technologies available, the, the specific classes that uh, uh, our friends are sharing. No? And we do work with all uh, partners, no? not only with, with uh, a particular country. No? Um, so just, just to give a bit of that uh, disclaimer aside, uh, Mimi, you have questions? Uh, yes, um, still addressed to Miss Kerry again. Um, it's a question of group of students in the uh, in the audience, I think they're asking about their assurance for data security. So how does Huawei um, assure everyone of this um, risk that we're facing? Uh, Kari, are you there? Kari, you're on mute. So we always tell and advocate that the security uh, we approach security in the spirit of collaboration and cooperation. Um, security is not only uh, the responsibility of vendors or suppliers like Huawei. Uh, it's everybody's responsibility. So we often tell in all, uh, you know, like forums or fora that we have attended, if you know something, don't tell us, tell our customers about it because they are the more vulnerable ones. And, um, and as per experience, most of the vulnerability doesn't happen in the bigger scale. Uh, it always happens in one individual opening a mail which contains a malware, you know, and then this goes to be viral. So it, it, it happens like that. So the, the, the point, the always, you know, like uh, uh, lowest hanging fruit is always the individual because there's judgment call whether you will open an email or not. 
So it, it's it's so that's why we tell them that uh, if you fear security, that's why we're o- we're offering um, you know like an insight into what what really goes on with Huawei. What are we teaching you? So it it's this uh, education is like you know fair fair play. So um, we are offering the curricula. We're not taking anything from you. So. So it's us giving. So I think uh, in terms of security, uh, there's no threat in education. Um, okay, thank you. Um, can I hear George also answer this, uh, the question about data security? Yes. Um, first of all, I think that, uh, you know, uh, we have been in the, te- I, I'm not uh, that technically proficient uh, uh regarding this security but i know enough to know that uh because we have been in this business in various uh forms including telecommunications the technical uh vulnerabilities are similar to uh various uh the same as with the us if you are using google or facebook now they already know everything about you they have pictures of where you live they know where what your roof, roof looks like they know how you behave they know uh, your gender, they know your preferences, they know everything about you already. You know, unless uh, you, you have some super secret, super technical thing, uh, I guess there's nothing really new that you can be afraid of. They, they monitor everything you say, even if uh, Google has admitted that they were keeping track of where you go, uh, even if your phone is off, and they can monitor what you're talking about and the sounds around you, even, and we're not blaming Google, we're just saying technically, it is regardless of the phone or the device, this is possible. But there's a difference because they have never actually caught, they keep saying, uh, they have never caught or bought an actual case against Huawei. Whereas the US has been caught several times monitoring not only ordinary people, all US citizens, according to Snowden, which he revealed and they're trying to imprison him for. And they have monitored over 30 heads of state in the in EU, no. So uh, it's not, it's not, it's possible, but it's up to you, no. Uh, the tech is available; it's all around us. And in fact, uh, Huawei has uh, given the option to the U.S. private company or government to examine its software, and it, it has announced it in the media, in the public, in the U.S. to examine its software and its hardware for any deficiencies, and in fact, is willing to license it out. But uh, the U.S. companies, the U.S. government has uh, made the, uh, the private companies to chat from using this. So there is no more. The U.S. is not willing to do that for China, but the Huawei is willing to do that for the U.S. So you make your own conclusions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for those. Um, j- just to, to insert also, no, I remember the president of uh, Globe Telecom saying that this is not a concern because the final... Uh, What's the correct word? The security uh, uh, precautions, the, the firewalls, uh, are actually on, on, on the hands of Filipino engineers. Is, is that correct? And related question to uh, Ms. Kari is, uh, can you share a bit on, uh, I, uh, we heard that uh, Huawei also works directly with these Filipino telecom companies to train their engineers uh, to upgrade to in their uh, technology uh, skills. No? Um, can you share a bit about that? Okay, uh, we also have uh, some arrangements with PLDT and Globe. So they open their own academy and uh, they invite uh, our experts to deliver courses, um, like uh, m- more siding on the practical things, like uh, particularly, like for example, they uh, asked us to do like uh, training in fiber splicing because this is not taught in any school. Uh, fiber splicing is new. So you need to to have this called fusion machine, which is very expensive. So that's why Huawei built its own training academy. It's actually in Paranaque, but it's closed now. So it's a 2,500 square meter uh, facility where we train people. Like we have make, uh, we have uh, a simulation or a demo of uh, smaller towers there, like maybe 15 feet in high in height, so that they can train. They can actually test if they can carry some of the equipment. So you know, practice on the safety gears because uh, these are the basic things that we need to re-educate uh, people. So especially on the standards and yeah, and uh, that's that's uh, you know more more siding on the practical things. 
Uh, I remember we, when we uh, were uh, discussing about the presentation, you also shared that uh, as, uh, the, the, as simple as the training for routers are very expensive to actually have the training, the actual training physical uh, apparatuses. So while we built a, a digital software that, that the students can play around with this uh, modules from their laptops, can you share a bit about that as well? Okay. Uh, actually, uh, we have, like, for example, if you enroll in routing and switching, uh, there's a laboratory uh, portion there, a laboratory training where they can download the software and then they can manipulate the equipment, they can do their programming, uh, they can test whether their codings are correct or not. So these are some of the things, uh, the practical things that the, um, the academy is teaching you. Okay. Thank you for, for those uh, insights as well and uh, helping the Filipinos uh, connect to the global digital future. Uh, you have a follow-up question, Mimi? Mimi, are, she's mute. Are you there? Yeah. Uh, wait, uh, there's no question for you. There's no question. Because uh, I, I will go back to the questions from the geopolitics side. From yeah, us. you can can you continue with the geopolitics first? Okay, that's okay. Yes. All right. Um, yeah, on, on, on my account, uh, anyone can answer. Uh, any comment on uh, our Secretary of Foreign Affairs' uh, recent comments about uh, uh, ba banning Chinese companies that are linked? Uh, because some of these Chinese companies... Uh, are part of the infrastructure building, not the build, build, build of, of the country. So now there are uh, news that these companies may be banned uh, if they are linked on the South China Sea activities. Uh, any comments? Sure. Uh, that is the position of the Philippine president, no? Because uh, uh, Mr. Teddy Boy Lopsin, the uh, Foreign Affairs Secretary, might be saying certain things that are only his personal opinion. No? Uh, and probably the President allows him to express his personal opinion. But all the time, um, whenever, whenever uh, it takes a stand and something of, uh, of uh, documented as a position, official position of the Philippines, no? It has to be clear to the president, and he's got to say it in a in a official form, like a not verbal or something. Well, we we can uh, that that uh, as uh, Butch says, it, it's up to the position of the president. The question is, what alternatives do we have for our different programs, or are we willing to give up or adjust the other programs? Uh, th that's a legitimate position to take that if you don't like someone or they offended you that you don't use them. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think that this has uh, happened with other countries. No? The same companies that uh, uh, built up the arms that invaded the Philippines uh, from Japan or from uh, the US or the people who did so are still doing business with them. Uh, if we look at the presidents of the Philippines and the elite families, many of them were drug dealers in China. Uh, the China still continues to deal with them. And Vietnam has uh, uh, disputes with uh, Chinese companies. But uh, in actuality, if you go on the ground, what people should do, what our media people and these uh, think tanks should do, is they should visit Vietnam and China and these countries and not meet a few people that were selected for them by their principals or whoever they're dealing with, but go to a widespread of people. And they will find that the business people don't really care, in fact, don't want to have problems. So even though the U.S. is saying uh, ban doing business with China, last year the investments going to China from the U.S. actually went up. And in fact, uh, China has continued to liberalize and has opened up uh, financial sector and parts of the retail sector, so J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, has just gone in and made investments aside from the major Japanese and European banks. In China, even though uh, Trump keeps attacking, is actually uh, liberalizing according to the agreed plan and continues to buy increased agricultural purchases from the US, although it doesn't meet the target because of the pandemic. They are, they are buying substantially more in 2020 
for the same months than in 2019. So uh, there, there are business realities we have to take into account. And, you know, for myself, my own experience is, you know, I might have had a fight with somebody, but if I can do business together with them, actually, I make millions a year dealing with people that I do not like or has uh, done offensive things to me before because why would you stop doing business if it still makes sense? No, unless, uh, unless it is something that is very personal and you know, some, something that really cannot be corrected. Okay, thank you very much for, for those insights. Uh, we will be wrapping up. I think uh, for the most part, we've answered all the questions. Uh, and uh, our, our experts have also answered some of the questions privately and, and uh, individually. No? So we will also share your comments directly to the speakers. No? So if, if, if you um, would like to get in touch, please do email us, idsicenter at gmail.com. Uh, any last uh, comments, statements from the speakers? Uh, one, one minute. I just, it's, since there are a lot of students, I want to say take this time watch YouTube, not for entertainment. There's so much learning that you can learn from the best in the world, from the CEOs as well as the managers, no? in any field you're in, whether it's architecture, engineering, whatever, electronics, uh, take time to learn. You, don't, you, you can enjoy yourselves, but take more time to learn also at this point. And spend time, if you can, talking also to uh, people who have experience in the field you want to be in. Great, and, and from everybody, from all countries? From all countries. Uh, Kari? Yeah, uh, from Huawei, uh, we tell them that it's connection, glory, future. Uh, your future is in your hands, so learning never stops. So just continue learning because uh, that will uh, arm you with all the training and the knowledge that you will need. It's not only Huawei. Uh, we, in, uh, during this pandemic, a lot of universities, even the United States, are offering courses online from content to advertising to all those practical skills that you can use. So explore. Great, great. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Ms. Kari, uh, with all due respect to the gentlemen in the room, I think you're the more popular ones because a lot of people are asking for your contact. So with your permission, okay. uh, yes. we will be sharing your contact now. They'll, ask, they'll like to get more details. Uh, and, and Mr. George and Mr. Uh, Butch, no, just quick question. There was a couple of... Uh, our younger audience, no, they're asking because they were planning to retire. Uh, do you have some quick suggest uh, on their retirement age? No, I guess they decided to retire uh, amidst the COVID, uh, and then they were inspired by uh, Mr. George's uh, comment that uh, uh, sometimes we retire too early when that might be the start of something new and something bigger. No, so maybe one line, two lines to these retirees. Sorry, I missed your question. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Butch. Well, sabi nga nila, ang tumatanda lang daw yung kalabaw. No? <laughs> so you and, have a elephant and a kalabaw uh, analogy for uh, us. To you know, many of us, when we say we retire, that means we stop earning money no? because we're retired. But that is not my idea of retirement. I don't think that uh, even if we have stopped uh, working, no? I, I don't think we stop thinking. No? And our, the value of our experiences no, is so much that it must be shared. It must be shared to the coming generations. And even if uh, they are to be shared, it does not mean that, you, that we, after, after we have retired, stop thinking about the future generations. Everything that we will do, everything that we will say, and all actions require that we do something for the succeeding generation. That's what makes life worth living. Thank you. Uh, the uh, best thing. Yeah, I, I'll give the closing remark to our, our president, Mr. George C., uh, who will... Uh, I, I, I probably won't say more. Maybe if you want to say something, Austin, because it's been such a wonderful close that uh, Gary and Butch gave. Uh, I just want to... Say yes, uh, life is worth living. If, if you're older now, uh, slow down, but don't stop. Look for another ecosystem you can plug into because the job was just another ecosystem. Because with your skills, nowadays, people, a lot of people want to look for uh, skills and experience. No? Uh, and then you can also, as Butch says, uh, train the next generation. Uh, so that, that's the best possible. And we all have to look beyond our own lifetime 
and do something for the collective good. And that's what MC is trying to do. Uh, we're trying to connect the different people and thoughts. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, maybe you want to say something, Austin. Uh, please stay safe and uh, do connect with us. We're, our website right now is under construction, but if you connect us with email, uh, please stay tuned. We have a series of webinars uh, from History, Geopolitics, South China Sea, uh, and we're going to be inviting former uh, ambassadors as well who have uh, decades of experiences and, and uh, insights now that they'll be sharing. Um, and of course, businessmen and, and uh, government officials and, and uh, other experts no so thank you very much with that and thanks for joining us and uh have a good uh, week ahead and stay safe right bye bye have a good night bye, everyone thank you oh, no.